From the HBA Podcast Studio in New York City, welcome to The Medium Rules. I'm Alan Baldishan. So when you took in some of these businesses, did you ingest, let's say, their sort of standalone silo, ad sales, marketing? It's a great question. And again, kind of brings controversy because it's so revolutionary, right? So B. Riley basically helped market those pipes early on. They were involved that early. Totally. Oh, and they, that's interesting. And they're amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, you should, you know, that company. Well, I've gotten to know growing. them a little bit, but, uh, yeah. but obviously they've done a great job with Maven. I mean, yeah. Now, have we not performed? They probably are real tough people. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Delighted to be joined in the uh, HBA podcast studio today with uh, James Heckman, CEO of Maven. Uh, which is a shared digital publishing, advertising, and distribution platform for publishers, which recently made headlines when it acquired both the Street.com and Sports Illustrated months apart in two th- late 2019. Ambitious? Check. Controversial? Check. But judging by Maven's fourth quarter 2019 results, Maven is a public company, which we'll discuss also. Maven's vision of digital publishing economics seems to be paying off, as Maven announced financial and digital numbers that exceeded expectations by quite a bit. In a digital publishing universe with a small number of winners and many losers, and notable mainly for its severe compression, how are James and his team pulling this off? Uh, Let's get into it. So, James, welcome. Thanks very much for coming in. Great to be here. Um, And first of all, congrats on the Sports Illustrated acquisition. I mean, that's a huge announcement, a major coup. Um... And we'll get into a little bit of the detail of, of how you guys pulled that off and, and how that's doing and, and what it brought to the table at Maven. But first, let me ask you, going into SI Lore, do you have a favorite cover that you would look back on, anything you would point to mm. as a kid? Well, you know, really a couple of them wasn't necessarily the covers, but the stories that really, um, I think, touched my life in a couple ways. One uh, was you know, very specific to my career. And the other was just, uh, waking up to great journalism and, um, uh, the, the recruitment of Marcus Dupree mm-hmm. was an amazing story to me to find out, um, how aggressive and excited and passionate college fans were, where they were handing out, you know, in aggregate millions of dollars for these, you know, high school kids and, you know, reading about them getting cars and the competition and, uh, you know, obviously we revolutionized that whole industry and, you know, consolidated uh, um, all of the college publications onto a single platform. And the core for subscriptions on that was um, college football recruiting. If you're not <clears throat> from the South, you didn't go to a major um, university, you don't really understand how big. But there's about 50 universities where each one of them are doing, you know, one to $400 million of revenue every year. And it comes down to the kids that decide to go to your school. So that was a big deal. And Marcus Dupree, in particular, is one of the greatest uh, talents out of high school. And he was just so overhyped that he, um, you know, built his head up and, and ended up uh, kind of flaming out. But it was just an incredible story and a story they broke, right? Because you had to find out stuff that was uh, not legal from an NCA standpoint. So that was a that was a big deal. I think the second one that was <clears throat> amazing was Chuck Muncie, that they got that story. And I remember a picture of his face on the cover and uh, he was freebasing cocaine before games and practices. That was kind of an era. I don't think people freebase anymore. They probably more sophisticated ways of taking drugs, but it wiped out his career and turned out, you know, cocaine was a big deal back then. And, uh, you know, I remember, um, Don Rogers dying, uh, from cocaine and just that whole eighties thing that SI had the type of journalist that could just get into. It was probably the best running back in the NFL at the time. And, uh, but it was great journalism yeah. and they really were in the inside and, and so great uh, writing talent, <clears throat> I mean, great, great writing, writing talent. talent. Yeah. Great. And you, when you, what we've learned is when you have that brand, uh, pretty much anyone wants to be featured in Sports Illustrated. And, you know, we've obviously modernized it. And, and as you said, have already had a, a, a great uh, year so far. But the brand carries uh, so much weight. It attracts journalists. Uh, people expect great journalism. Athletes want to be featured. They want to open up. Uh, they show up to our Persons of the Year. They show up to our uh, Super Bowl events. They want to be photographed, and, and that goes from high schools to up. And I think, you know, the problem, which is really the problem with <clears throat> major media, um, is that being a great journalist doesn't mean that you are a rocket science scientist. 
Um, being a great journalist doesn't mean in this uh, era that you can reach a half a billion people. And in the day before the internet, just being SI meant people would walk into the newsstands or get a subscription. And so there was this massive gap in terms of the need to modernize uh, Sports Illustrated. And that really is how all the people that have been with me, and you know, I've got one person who's just started at SI started with me in 1989. We've been doing one thing and uh, one thing only, and it's everything except the journalism. And we do, we do it all. And again, being a great writer doesn't mean that you have access to advertising dollars or that uh, you've got the ability to build a great technical infrastructure, um, the ability to integrate with advertising. <clears throat> and so what we started back, you know, in the 80s, you know, from Seattle, um, digital publishing was founded there. That's where, if you can remember back, you know, PageMaker, yeah. um, StarWave came out of Microsoft, Real Networks was the first yes. uh, digital video platform, encoding, a couple fraternity brothers of mine from University of Washington was the first, di you know, video encoders. And um, w we were buying computers in Seattle before people were even thinking about computers. And so digital publishing was something that I got into in 1984, started publishing yearbooks for colleges and, you know, eventually um, ran the press center for uh, Ted Turner for the Goodwill Games, you know, in my early 20s. And, you know, maybe it's like the people who, uh, you know, started doing airplanes or cars, you know, you got to be in your early 20s or late teens to do something that crazy to take those kind of risks. And we went all in in digital publishing. And eventually I took over, you know, every uh, NFL season ticket holder magazine. And I just remember this amazing moment sitting with a CMO of, um, of Lexus. And just to, you know, kind of tell you a full circle, <clears throat> I held up a Sports Illustrated, laid it on the table, and then I held a NFL exclusive. And we had, you know, 30 magazines for 30 teams. Jaguars and Titans weren't there yet. And I, and I said, what's your favorite team? And he said, Raiders. So I held up the LA Raiders because they were in LA at the time. And then I held Sports Illustrated. And I started flipping the pages. And I said, tell me left and right if you're interested in the article. And there was one article. Tell anyone to stop. Kind yeah. Of, yeah. <clears throat> at SI, they had one story he liked. But he liked every page for the Raiders because he's a Raider fan. And I said, which page do you want to be on on SI? He said, well, only that page. Right. But what about L.A.? And, and, and we had the technology it was the first network publishing system and it was before the Internet where the writers would would produce the content for the NFL teams. And we had 30 different versions on a single platform printed at the same time. And we really started our company then, which was uh, national distribution arbitraging that national reach by going national advertising and a technical infrastructure to do all the work so that the brilliance of the writer could be properly monetized. So James, this is the <clears throat> 80s we're talking about now? So this is print or this is digital? Yeah, so we... Um, yeah, because this is pre-internet now. Right, so right. first we did yearbooks uh, okay. uh, and that was super early. You know, we were really the first uh, to do premium color digital publishing then the Goodwill Games in 1990, that was kind of the detente breaking moment. And so we ended up beating the Seattle Times for that contract and did 18 magazines in 18 days, okay. all color. Uh, then in 91, we won an NFL contract in 92 at NCA. So we ended up, you know, eventually having, you know, hundreds of magazines all operating with just a handful of people. Um, so pre-internet. So that was really the first kind of ad network. Okay. <laughs> it was the very first, yeah. uh, I would call pre-internet blogging platform and we had all the engineers we wanted in Seattle because they monopolized engineering there was no Google there was no Yahoo you know it was all sitting in Seattle and so a lot of it was just fortune and just being at a university where all the Microsoft engineers are being built uh, gave us uh, a focus now I knew that we couldn't create content for the New York Giants the Giants told me who they wanted to cover them Right. We knew that Notre Dame, we weren't going to try to write about Notre Dame. And so what happened is we submitted and gave up the idea that we were the experts at the local and microscopic level. And so the first notion of a digital blogging network was really our company, you know, way pre-internet. <clears throat> and then at Rivals, of course, we had 1,500 sites on a single platform. And that was really the first large scale uh, single platform uh, network. SoftBank was my partner and... Uh, uh, News Corp and Intel. And it was all very, very edgy stuff. But in the end, we passed ESPN and page views by 2001. Um, because when you combine the local passion 
or, you know, when you think about blogging, maybe you're writing about crypto or Trump or, you know, climate change or whatever, everybody has their passions. And <clears throat> as you know, uh, you've got your family, you've got your job, and then you've got your passion. And people don't have 8,000 passions. And so if you get the right expert to cover that passion, it's way better than journalism coming out of one office and one brand. And so, you know, back to full circle, SI has been stuck in the 80s from a business model standpoint, trying to cram everybody onto a sports portal. But being all things to all people doesn't work anymore. That's not how the content is consumed. And they're trying to stuff news into a magazine. And again, that ended, you know, maybe sometime in the mid 90s. And so what we've done is we've taken our technology that we're operating for hundreds of great journalists, you know, it's misunderstood and controversial. Um, But but we have liberated and provided sustainability for the most brilliant journalist who will write about climate change or Trump protest or Dallas Cowboys or crypto. And they can't do it on their own because they don't have the national reach. They don't have distribution. They don't have a budget. They don't have technology. And as you know, uh, this phone has 20 different platforms and it yeah. changes every day and Microsoft and uh, Google Google changes its algorithm. So we were able to, we had these stunning numbers in the fourth quarter, is essentially modernize SI in 30 days. We ripped them out of their old platform and instead of one portal with everything stuffed into it, we already have 100 Sports Illustrated. Um, our number one site is the Dallas Cowboys. That's SI- amazing. America's team. Well, let me back you up and uh, you know, uh, uh, let, let's walk through that a little bit. So Rivals gets started when, and the animating idea of Rivals is really what you just described, which is we're going to have multiple, multiple, what, points around a single platform? Yeah, you know, so we we really think about it. So, I mean, it's a great way of putting it and just a little more specificity. We believe in ownership and I'm probably not excited about... <clears throat> Uh, people cut cut a paycheck. We want them to be invested in the um, in what they're building, and so we're going to come out with um, really excited about working with the union a revolutionary model where their workers are not just cutting a paycheck, but are going to actually um, be able to get uh, yield out of the you know the profits and the success of our new business model. And I think we're turning around that you know, conversation, but to, to be specific, just, 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 just to <clears throat> jump in the union, the unionized SI writers you're talking correct, about, right? Correct, yep. correct. Okay. But, you know, I think what's happened is they've all been thousands and thousands, 30,000 journalist jobs have been lost in the last few years and we're providing new hope and new opportunities. So if you are covering the Dallas Cowboys working for the Dallas morning news, you know, the salary is shrinking and the jobs are going away. Yep. Uh, We brought in Mike Fisher, who's the most well-known journalist in Cowboys, and this is kind of a test case here, uh, an example. And we built a business for Mike Fisher. He, in four months, already has added a million users to a business that didn't exist just four months ago, um, making good money. And uh, within our uh, system, um, it's an SI brand. Sports Illustrated could never cover the Cowboys sufficiently here in New York. And now we have the best Dallas Cowboys Cowboys reporter uh, working for Sports Illustrated, but operating a Cowboys website. And so effectively, we've got, you know, roughly 100 Sports Illustrated websites. That's how people consume. Um, And we now, Jim Cramer went from having one street site he actually is our first independent journalist. We've spun him out, and he's got his own. Web, he's got two websites. He's added a third. He's now talking about fantasy football with us, just to connect SI That's incredible. and the street. But he owns three businesses. Makes sense in a way. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we want to free a journalist to have a great, sustainable business with a, a future where they build their audience, they own their own audience, they own that relationship. And I think with the, the monopolies like Facebook, Facebook kind of steals that data. You kind of have to play, play uh, by debilitating rules. So because we had worked with these journalists back in the 80s and 90s, um, because we learned that <clears throat> We wanted to save money on paper and postage, and we converted all those sports magazines to websites. We learned that we could efficiently run it. We could bring in a lot of money because we've got you know all the engagement plus all the broad reach, and we had great technology because that's where we spent our money. Somebody could step in at Notre Dame or step in at Alabama or Dallas Cowboys, 
and immediately made money with us at at Rivals. And that was, you know, really the the first large scale uh, social network that in Silicon Investor. Uh, I was the first large scale uh, uh, blogging network. And um, we've just run several businesses like that since. We built a subscription network called Scout, which Athletic is, you know, essentially copied. Uh, we built a, a company called Five to One, which was a single platform. Uh, BBC, Fox, Disney, AOL, Yahoo all got together on our platform and became a very big company at Yahoo. But independent media companies <clears throat> sharing a platform, sharing technology, sharing distribution, and having a one-stop shop ad buy has proven to be a very sustainable model over the last 30 years for us. So when you took in some of these businesses, <clears throat> did you ingest, let's say, their sort of standalone siloed ad sales, marketing? How did you kind of rationalize all those functions when yeah. you were bringing these teams in? It's a great question. And again, kind of brings controversy because it's so revolutionary, right? Uh, you know, History Channel was losing money digitally. We came in and took over the digital group, uh, started selling advertising, you know, for them. Uh, they immediately get cost savings. We're doing the billing and the collecting and basically giving money back to History Channel, Biography, Yoga Journal, Ski Magazine, Oxygen, Rachel Ray, Sports Illustrated, The Street. So in every, in every conversation, <clears throat> people will say, hey, we would love for you to do advertising for us or yeah, we'll take a distribution deal or we'll do this. We're very strict in our discipline. We have a world-class team of engineers from Google and Microsoft and Yahoo and Amazon and we run this platform efficiently. And so to answer your question specifically, we take over at SI, we took over finance, we took over operations, we actually injected our subscription person, could have been in print subscriptions forever. Uh, middle management layer, you know, is typically removed. Um, all engineers disappear. Um, anything that's duplicative of our infrastructure. So on the one hand, you could say, well, that's, you know, terrible. What about the lost jobs? Um, but it real, it literally is saying it's terrible that horseshoe makers and ho horse buggy whip makers, sure. right? Nice. You know, we're an infrastructure that can come in immediately. Sports Illustrated saw an uplift in revenue, in traffic, uh, download speed went up. Ad agencies all of a sudden showed up at the door. We're ready to give money to Sports Illustrated because it's part of bigger scale. Um, uh, everything improved immediately, right? And you, you don't need two CFOs. You don't need two COOs. You don't need two subscription managers. You don't need two technologies, right? Um, and so uh, by de-duping uh, what I would say overhead, we were able to announce, you saw, uh, we, we saved, in a lot of areas we came up with, $27 million of the operating expenses came out. Traffic went up, engagement went up, revenue's gone up. Print subscriptions, even though we moved it to a more efficient monthly model, uh, not covering news, but now covering feature articles, uh, the subscriptions keep rolling in. And uh, and that's what we're doing to the street. Take, take a guy like Kramer. He <clears throat> Is there any concern that he would build, I mean, he's already got an audience, but is there a concern somebody would sort of take advantage of the platform, build up an audience, and then break away? Oh, totally. And, and in fact, we say this lovingly no different than sometimes happens in sports. We say, hey, we were created, we, we've created a lot of monsters, <laughs> right? And, um, but it's kind of good, right? Uh, a little, you think about Duke basketball for those basketball fans. Everybody complains that, you know, they bring in these great players, they win a national title, and then they go into the NBA. I mean, let's just go on. You, win a, you get a national title, and then you get to point to him and say, look what Duke did for that person. Do you want, you, you might, you want to win a national title and yeah. go to the NFL? So we look at it very positively and come on in, let us build your company. And if you sell it to a uh, Disney or Hearst, you know, make sure we get to come to the party. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> say good things about us. Tell your friends. Yeah. <clears throat> right. But yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah, to be fair. honest, it's very, it's, it's infrequent. Um, certainly, Jim Cramer is already a legend. Yep. I think what he would say if you asked him is that more people are reading his stuff now. Uh, you know, even though we cut significant out of the streets overhead, uh, 
we've increased subscription revenue from 19 million to 21 million run rate. We're bringing in advertisers that had given up on the street a long time ago. The download time on their pages is is great, and we'll be building out a street network similar to what we're doing at Maven. And so, you know, we love Jim Cramer, but we also think that he's enjoying the fact that as opposed to him worried about finance and middle management and why is the technology not working better and having to go to ad sales meetings and I mean it's exhausting to be a, a you know a brilliant creative and also have to worry about business operations. I mean even even if they didn't make more money, I would say it's just a relief. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean so the ones that end up being great at business operations, they start cutting into their focus on creativity. So it's really, I mean, would you guys, we'll stay on this for a moment, would you look to add additional sort of tentpole titles or or, or are you kind of taking a pause with what you did second half of 2019, focusing on building that network out and continuing to add mavens at maybe some of the lower tiers? That's a great question. Well, first of all, we have so much work to do. And uh, I think we're <clears throat> creating so much disarray and chaos in the market coming in here as tech people from the West Coast and coming into New York and... Stepping all over the... Ste- uh, yeah. Walking around, <laughs> like, who are these cute yeah. guys? And, I, you know, I that's been a lot of fun. But... Uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Very compelling. Look, people get angry when they are afraid. And I think um, everyone at Sports Illustrated knew that they were living in a cadaver. And, you know, we, we've, uh, the eyes are opening. I think the attitudes are lifting. Uh, and the, it's just undeniable when you see your traffic and revenue and everything getting better. And uh, we know that, that in the end, uh, people are going to delight in Sports Illustrated like they haven't since the 80s. And most of it's from our business model and technology. And then we take the brilliant creatives, you know, sitting there yesterday with a, <clears throat> in a union discussion with a Sports Illustrated employee. And he said, the bottom line is we just want to be read. Yeah. Jim Cramer told me the same thing. And have stability. Right. I think that, that's it, right? Those are the two things. You know, we turned that thing profitable and it went from 20 million viewers to 30. Year over year, they were at 13 million. We'll finish the month at 30. Yeah, that, can't, that cannot complain. Yeah. Are you guys uh, doing, in terms of revenue, are you doing sort of, I guess, bigger ticket marketing programs, or is it principally just driving traffic and programmatic, or is it somewhere in between? Well, it's a lot of things, and I think when you've got scale, you're able to do a lot of things well. The incremental work for us to add street in the discussions with ad agencies is, is really zero. It's actually makes it easier for us. And so I think we're doing very well in direct sales. We're ver- doing very well with PMPs, so private marketplaces, because we have big scales and big brands and quality journalism. Uh, we are uh, increasing page views or inventory per session because the load time is so fast. Uh, again, it doesn't take us extra work to have great technology, right? Right. Uh, we have uh, at, uh, you know, Google recognizes we have authentic journalists that we're not aggregating, we're not doing link bait, we're not tricking people to come to the page. We actually reduced ad load. So we've reduced the amount of ads on the page, but revenue is going up. And it's because consumers are not waiting as long to read it, right? And so if they can consume three pages instead of one, but we reduce the ad load by half, we actually have more inventory, right? So more inventory with faster ad loads. Um, I think the design is is uh, better for people to find stuff uh, now that we have um, a network of sports sites. If somebody's on the Cowboys and we put up a fantasy story, now all of a sudden we've created internal distribution. So there's all kinds of network effect things that don't take incremental investment or work. And so a lot of things end up doing well. Let me answer your question that I did a bad job on earlier on, you know, are you going to pause here? So got a lot of cleanup work, a lot of execution, a lot of cultural work, uh, turning an old school media company into a tech minded uh, company. So I would say we're going to do some slowing, um, uh, but we're a very aggressive company. At the end of the day, uh, we're focusing um, uh, on 
making sure that we've got a great brand for 34 or 35 verticals. So crushing it in sports right now. Finance is growing. We're going to accelerate that. Uh, history and military, by the way, is huge, right? There was a time when History Channel actually had more traffic to it than ESPN. So, so news has become, <clears throat> we're going to do news, but news has become so controversial and divisive that a lot of brands are pulling out. That same mature, adult, educated audience are the same audience that, that read history, follow military, things that are nonpartisan. And so we think we have a great opportunity in the history space uh, to get brands to get behind. So that's a third vertical that we're very strong in. We have over 30 million people in that area. Uh, and, um, you know, it won't make an announcement, but we're going to be aggressive growing that area as not a news alternative, but a place, a safe place for brands. Um, <clears throat> and then you're going to see us roll out in the future travel and autos and parenting and entertainment. And, you know, in the end, we want to build a next generation Yahoo, right? Reaching all humans in a very safe environment with great journalism. Uh, but a single database and a single platform where advertisers can just pull up and say, we want 25 to 36 uh, mother expecting women. <laughs> okay, great. We got 3 million. Yeah. We want truck and tenders in a sports and finance environment. Great. 6.8 million, right? Uh, so we're very accustomed to working um, at a multi-billion dollar uh, advertising scale. You know, we've got leaders who've built, you know, Acuin from Omnicom and uh, senior leaders at AppNexus and Yahoo and Right Media. And so we think we have a, a, a great group of people who are pioneers in the industry in advertising. And if you're an ad agency, you just want things to be easy and safe and high scale. We can do the work, you know. Sometimes I'll compare it to Saudi Arabia, right? Exxon wants to pull up and, and, and buy sweet crude with the lowest friction possible. Buying shale oil in Alberta takes a lot of work, <laughs> right? So for agencies to get margins, now that they've consolidated, you're talking about a 3 to 6% margin, right? Back in the 80s, they had a 15% margin. It was super easy for them. And now they've got all these data issues and safety issues and is it above the fold and did the video complete? They've gotten so smart that it's very difficult for them to survive. When they work with us, everything's easy. 100% safe, no fraud, low ad load. We're transparent for their ad servers to look at, you know, who they're reaching, you know, their iOS issues. But the, the, the main thing is that high scale, quality, premium, and senior engineers from places like Google that they're interacting with, they can make a margin with us, right? The agencies can. The ad agencies can. So you're working with agencies. Yeah. You're not trying to get rid of them. You're not trying to go necessarily direct and squeeze them out. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a concern for them. So, sure. You know, I think exactly. all... Uh, yeah. So all the stakeholders win yeah. with Maven. Consumers, when they come into an environment like Amazon for commerce, 100% of the content's premium professional. Um, easy navigation, you know, fast download. So they so they win. The agencies win because it's uh, inexpensive, safe, and um, uh, we work with them. We're very friendly to the agencies. Um, investors win because as we grow, we don't have to increase operating uh, expenses material because it's a single platform. So they know that in a world where media companies are collapsing, we're actually benefiting by the media companies' challenges in technology so we can help... The media companies benefit. Journalists now have a sustainable opportunity to make a living. And so if we can stay in our lane, not try to be a social network, not try to be all things to all people, we're not a platform where journalists can just show up and use it, like Medium or you know Twitter or YouTube. We're very careful. We hand-select professionals, and it's a long process because we don't want any one journalist to bring down the network. Let me, let me wind back to when Maven was started. Um, this vision that you just articulated of a single platform uh, curating audiences in categories, the, the next generation Yahoo, that was the vision back in 2000, 2017 when you really started self-funding this thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, you guys made the decision not to take venture 
at the time and to reverse merge into a public shell. Can you talk a little bit about that decision and how that's played out, uh, the ups and downs of that over the past two or three years? I mean, you know, it's paying off now. Um, what what went into that? What was what, yeah. was what was your thought process? So first of all, everything we do is contrarian, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we give up control to journalists. We want them to have control of their audience and data. That scares people. Um, you know, we don't want a platform where anybody can use it. You know, that would scare the venture capitalists because they're worried about scale. Um, you know, we're contrarian in that way. Um, and we're a contrarian um, also on uh, our capital structure. And, you know, I learned at a very, you know, young age, we took money from SoftBank, I think 50 million or something like that. The liquidation preferences alone on that were triple. Um, and so uh, I remember getting a, an inbound from a major media company to buy, um, you know, my company for $100 million and couldn't sell it to them. Yeah. Right? That didn't include Intel's investment or News Corp. Pro- we would have... Uh, did you try and talk SoftBank out of their three X at that time? The market was just <laughs> falling apart, but you know w- we could have gotten out if we didn't have debilitating um, preferences. And by the way, they weren't doing anything wrong. They're doing whatever he's doing in venture Listen, capital. That's what they negotiated. That's what the industry. And, and and you're right that back then the multiple liquidation preferences were a thing. But it, you know look, you don't see it now. You wouldn't see it now. But back I, then it was the case. I mean, I I don't know that that's true. You know, App Nexus sold for one point seven billion, and less than five people uh, at the company made money. So because of the preferences, I mean, yeah. venture capital has a thing where they get their money out first, um, typically at least a one x before participating, and um, you know I, I I just I don't appreciate. Uh, the benefits, right? I think for every Snapchat and Facebook that you read, um, you know, there's Zynga's, right? So the employees who build the company, um, they sit behind the preference, the venture gets out with Goldman Sachs at the, you know, at the opening, and then all the employees are locked up and maybe they get out. But you're talking about a four or five year process minimum. And then um, all the hogs have taken out all the good stuff. Right. And then, you know, obviously the investment bank comes in and takes their big chunk because they need to arbitrage the event. So they, you know, in the mezzanine, allow all their clients to get in and further dilute the company. And then they get out two months later. It's just it's a it it's the regular way. It's sexy to say, hey, we took a you know top tier VC and then got public. The reality is the great engineer who created that product, they typically don't make anything. And. You know, They're yes. really back of the bus. Yeah, it's just terrible. Yeah. So listen, I, we looked at it differently. Um, you know, we had a company five to one that we sold to Yahoo for thirty million dollars, and that seemed, would be a loss. That'd be a devastating blow. All our top people made a lot of money and went out and bought new houses, right? Because we believe in common stock, no preferences, and uh, we'd get laughed out of Silicon Valley offices. So what I just, you know. Uh, took it out of my balance sheet, funded the company to get it going, and um, protected our employees. That's what's number one. I mean, the people who build the company are the ones that need to be the first first on the list. And, you know, we found a great investment partner in B. Riley, and a person, you know, they worked very hard to understand our business. They're very involved. And if you can find a good boutique investment bank to get behind you, and if you have good people and you've got a good product, and an investment bank's not going to give you money unless you have a product that's going to, make money, right? I mean, the, the advantage of venture capital is they'll literally let you lose money for five years for a big vision. And without them, we wouldn't have the Googles and Amazons. I mean, Amazon lost money for, you know, whatever, 20 years, right? right? And so I'm not saying there's not a place. They go for crazy grand slams and one out of a thousand is a grand slam. And they're so big that their investors make money. And then the ones that don't make it, they sell to their friends at a 1x, you know, aqua hire, and they get a lot of their cash yeah, back. Yeah, so yeah. it's a great model for them. Yep. Uh, but listen, we believe in building a company that's profitable. Uh, we uh, will have a, we believe we'll have a profit, profitable, uh, you know, company borrowing, you know, borrowing, you know, some unforeknown circumstance. But we're on track to do that. And we launched our network two years ago. That's unheard of to have a nine-figure business that's that successful. Um, but our, you know, our banking partner, our goal is uh, that everybody has the same preference, that everybody has a chance to 
uh, build equity to you know own a beautiful home and see the benefits for their brilliant hard work. What uh, what were some of the challenges early on? What, what prior to kind of getting so now you're a public company, putting aside you know reporting obligations and other things. Mm-hmm. W- were you able to tap? The public markets. You, you. What, what was that first year like in terms of, you know, raising money and 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 sur- surviving? Yeah, I wouldn't recommend for a twenty-five-year-old executive to try to do something like this. I mean, there, the, you, you, we have a veteran crew and a great CFO, and have navigated all kinds of things because not only um, are we doing this, we've done some acquisitions to. Um, uh, bring in some great technology platforms so we can cover end to end for you know for publishers, and uh, you know we didn't actually buy SI. We bought a hundred year license yep. uh, for Sports Illustrated, and um, you know that that you know wasn't free, and and the street wasn't free. And to do that, the nice thing about uh, the public market is that you have investors who are willing to do pipes. And so, you know, what what, what ended up happening is we've got, um, instead of being on a road show for six months, like you are sometimes with venture capital, um, it's just debilitating going into these funds. Um, our bank, investment bank partner, B. Riley, they've got, they're trusted with these uh, small cap company investors and raising money where they know they're going to have a liquidity event or much a higher likely um, they they strike quick. So, to be honest with you, um, way easier to raise money uh, in in the, within this capital structure than raising money um, private money from venture capital or private equity. So B Riley yeah. basically helped market those pipes early on. They were involved that early. Totally, and oh, they, that's interesting. And they're amazing. Yeah. I mean, I you should you know that company. Well, I've gotten to know growing. them a little bit, but uh, yeah. but obviously they've done a great job with Maven. I mean, yeah. Now, if we not perform, they probably are real tough people. Maybe. Yeah. You'll find out. Well, hopefully you won't find out. Um, speaking of acquisitions, uh, rewinding prior to uh, the street and NSI, um, you guys acquired uh, Say Media and you acquired Hub Pages. Um, talk a little bit about each of those acquisitions and why they were strategic at the time and what they brought to the table in yeah. terms of your platform. Yeah, the days of having a WordPress site and uh, going into an open auction and having a sustainable business are over. Um, uh, 80% of traffic, certainly news traffic, is through the phone. And, uh, you know, there are probably 10 to 12 platforms for Android and iOS and all the things we talked about earlier. And so I think being able to integrate and uh, survive within a Google world is really important. And Hub Pages, now it's been 12 years. Uh, building the technology and having the expertise to make sure that our journalists are read and found on Google. Um, people don't go to portals anymore. I mean, with few exceptions, uh, they're going to type Mahomes highlights, right? Uh, Eli Manning retirement, right? And they're going to trust that Google's going to bring them the best story. So we're now very good at that. Uh, Hub pages brings us about 50 million users per month. And then the other, you know, 70 million, uh, they work within a system that Hub Pages built for us, and that's why we were able to add 10 million users uh, on Sports Illustrated is because we really are uh, publishing in a way that consumers can find us at the story level. So that was important. And then that was a great technical team with engineers from Berkeley and Stanford and Princeton and Tufts and uh, the CEOs at Cal Poly, computer scientists, ex-Microsoft exec. So most of our senior people are engineers. Um, same media, th- same thing. Ben Trott was uh, one of the early pioneers in blogging, founded Six Apart and TypePad, if you remember uh, yep. you know that, uh, and um, has been working on CMS systems uh, f- since, I don't know, 2001 or so. Uh, great engineer out of Santa Clara. And uh, we picked up his team. Um, uh, we didn't take their sales team and middle management. We did a classic Maven, which is, you know, <laughs> cherry pick. Yeah, right. So we got great engineers, great engineering, and but just amazing. When we ended up buying Say, they had been working with Biography, but the um, stability of our company and our engineering combined with theirs was so attractive that History Channel signed with us, and together we did a great job. Uh, but uh, what we noticed is that in 30 days, Say Media's technology actually can go and grab every story and video ever produced from History Channel 
and move it over and republish it in our platform and in a great way that we didn't you know lose any kind of CEO uh, power and in fact traffic went up and before we acquired say when we were moving people over to our system we were literally going overseas and having them cut and paste and I mean it was really difficult so they have great technology to ingest major media and instead of traffic going down it immediately goes up and then when you add uh, Maven's community platform, some of what we do in video and with apps, our ad platforms, extraordinary. And then you add the uh, uh, certainly the hub pages technology, which is great for uh, people discovering content. With so many layers of technology, you got a 20-year system uh, out of Ben Ben Trotts. Uh, team, you've got 12 years from Hub Pages. Our team has been working together for you know 20, 25 years, so you really have um, uh, a platform where we can come right in, and you know almost like magic, they've gone from uh, old technology portal level uh, to having Facebook, Twitter-like technology and proficiencies from distribution, technical publishing, and advertising. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, the SI deal, which was pretty unique um, in the sense that, as you mentioned earlier, it's a license, and, and that was fairly well covered in the media. How did that come about? Um, Sports Illustrated was the assets were acquired by Authentic Brands Goods, uh, Jamie Salter's company out of Toronto and New York. Um, talk through a little bit the thought process of saying, you know, we're not going to own this. We don't need to own this. We're going to license it. We have what we need. I mean, just maybe give a little bit of that background. Yeah, no, I mean, I think some people have confused. Even though we did acquire the street, the first thing we did is cut a deal with Jim Cramer so he could own his content. So we're very contrarian. We don't want to own content, okay? We want to create such great service and such an ecosystem of power so that independent media companies and journalists can be owners. This is the opposite, right? Is it an effect in that, and, and to pause you there, <clears throat> the idea is basically saying you're the entrepreneur writer. You're going to do what you're, 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 you don't work for us, in right. effect. I mean, it's the opposite of Ox, right? And I know that they've got a platform that they're um, distributing, and they're a great company, and Jim Bankoff's a very successful executive, and I'm sure they're going to be really successful. Um, but I, you know, my feeling is is that owning technology, distribution, and advertising, and having to you know build a massive content uh, library is uh, so capital intensive that the day that you can actually say you're generating cash, maybe never. Right. Um, and so what we've done is we've said, hey, you know, Jim, run your own thing, and then we're out seeking great financial journalists, right? So. Internally, we may have some rock stars, kind of like what we have with Sports Illustrated right now. But really what we want is want those rock stars to help amplify great team writers, right? And so when we looked at SI, um, I don't think another company after ABG Bottom would want to come in and, and commit the resources that we have in SI uh, with ABG owning the brand. But we're the right partner for them because we don't mind, right? What we want to do is... Uh, operate distribution, advertising, and tech platform, and let great journalists um, build a business uh, for themselves. Um, we have some protections in that we've got a 100-year license, and at our option, every 10 years, we can extend as long as we do certain things like pay our bill. Um, <laughs> but uh, for the most part, um, I mean, we've already... Uh, I think we're getting very close to already... Um, beating our minimum requirement to renew 10 years from now we've gr we're growing the business so fast so um anyway the thought process and the story was pretty interesting we were bidding on it um we had uh put a bid as high as 100 million dollars and we were trying to find out who our competition was and uh when it got back to us that it was abg you know backed by leonard green and, and blackrock and general atlantic the last thing you want to do is it's like the Germans fighting the Americans. You're just going to lose a war of attrition. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like not, it's not going to work, right? And uh, 
And so we started doing research and um, our biggest investor, Bryant Riley, who's the CEO and founder of B. Riley, said, hey, this is a beast of a company and somebody would like to do business with. And uh, so that was attractive. I mean, it's actually a, a, you know, a, a great thing to have a, a partner like that. And I think um, we do what they don't, right? And so I thought, hey, well, maybe we can operate the business just like they do with Muhammad Ali and Ju- Juicy Couture and uh, Hickey Freeman and Spider. Yeah. You know, they, they own the brand, but they find the best in class to run it. And, you know, we're very proud that we're chosen. Um, we're so aggressive that we're scaring the hell out of everybody, right? We don't wait a year to see how things are going and meet people and kind of think about someday, you know, doing efficiencies. Within 10 minutes, we were cutting. Well, one of the first things you did was was get rid of the weekly, and I guess by then it was Biley Weekly Magazine, but you guys completely turned that upside down. And I guess today, I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the first issue of the newly reformatted, rethought SI Magazine hits newsstands. Yeah. Um, we, will, we will get a slide of that and put it up in the edit, but uh, that's exciting. And, and that's, I mean, maybe talk a little bit about what you did on the print side, and then you know, actually, I'd be interested to hear hear what you think about print. Yeah. Um, but so, so maybe that's a, that's a that's a that's a that's a nice way to go. Let, 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 you know, you may have made the decision to cut out print entirely. That may or may not have been okay with ABG, but you're really trying to take advantage of print. We love print. It's where we started our careers, and um, I have a great love for books. I have a book collection at home, <laughs> and uh, but uh, print is out of the news business, right? By definition, by the time you have to print something, it's not even news, right? And so um, they were incrementally cutting, but they still had a news room for print. It was just ludicrous. You know, it's like two weeks later reading that Tiger Woods won the Masters. It was just so silly. So I think by coming in new, we're able to make decisions that they had to know were the right decisions, right? Trying to cover local from New York. We got a lot of controversy for, controversy for that. But nobody with a brain believes that somebody with no relationship with the coach and the players should be doing daily news coverage of the Dallas Cowboys sitting in New York. It's just stupid. So a lot of the stuff that was there, we just did it boldly. We came in on day one and did all the changes. You know, everybody's going to hate you. You know, layoffs, changes, new right, jobs. Weather the storm. Yep. Right. And so, but, you know, look, we, we pride ourselves in not wasting our investors' money. I want every dime to go to the future. And, uh, you know, look, if we were a charitable organization, then maybe we wouldn't have made these decisions. But, I, you know, I don't think uh, the journalists want to be read by five people. Just, you know, it doesn't make sense. So. We're, we were very aggressive. Four of whom are in doctors and dentist offices. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I think um, these are great journalists. Yeah. We want them to be read by 100 million people, not 1 million. Uh, we want them to make a good living. Uh, we want these journalists to be part owner of the company. Uh, we want them to get stock that's common of a public company, not stock that's never going to make them any money. Uh, we want them to help local journalists, when a local story becomes national, kick in you know, that national uh, uh, great talent that they have at Sports Illustrated. So I think, and be part of a great Dallas Cowboys story. But they, you can't cover the Dallas Cowboys every hour because those aren't national stories. So we think we have a good plan. We believe in it. Uh, we executed it immediately. We're going to aggressively pursue it. We're doing the same exact plan for the street. Um, uh, specific sites on specific sectors curated at the national level if it's national story with a great leader like great brand like Kramer and we've got a great brand like Sports Illustrated uh, we've got other great brands and we're going to be building networks on a single platform going forward how do you evaluate uh, what you want the print to do for you oh yeah well listen I think it's just beautiful and they've got a great photo team and great journalists and so if you you know pick up the magazine and you should uh, it's a um, something that's timeless so the physical thing is timeless, and it's very simple. Don't write anything that's not timeless, right? It can't be time sensitive. It can't be irrelevant in two weeks. Again, these are things that it, you know, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out, but it's just big companies are afraid to make bold moves. 
right? So all we've done is uh, monthly, better paper, better quality, bigger, and everything written in there, 10 years from now, if you read, it's going to be special. So it's really a disruptive approach to, to the media business. So, you know, um, you see some of these big behemoths struggling, like Hearst, Condé Nast, news, very few media. I mean, you mentioned Vox, which has had its struggles, BuzzFeed, obviously. Let's say, for example, hypothetically, you were, you were recruited and you stepped in, you were the president of Hearst Magazines. What would you do, whether it be Hearst, whether it be Condé Nast, why do you think they're struggling so much? Is it, is it just the classic difficulty of turning a Titanic around? Is it, is it uh, cultural? Is it just they just can't get on top of their costs? What, 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 why can't these guys kind of adapt, do you think? I, or why I, are they struggling to adapt? I don't want to be so categorical, but... but. No, for sure. I, I, first of all, I think Condé Nast is a well-run company. I think Hearst is a well-run company. And they've got some incredible investments in technology. And if you look at Condé Nast's portfolio, you'd be surprised at some of the great uh, uh, companies that they have within their system. Uh, uh, City Business Journals is local. They're doing a nice job on um, their local digital and the way that they approach sales. I think they're in and out of Reddit, which is, I think, really you know visionary. I think these guys uh, are are build have built a tech platform to help all their titles. That's a single platform, and I think they'd be better off using ours. But they, but they got the right idea. Um, so I think any of the struggles. Now I'm specifically talking about Hearst and Con and Ast. You bring them up because they're you know big companies. You know, Trey Young is over there. He was actually co-founder of Say Media, which we bought. So they're picking and a guest on this show. Yeah, uh, prior guest he, on the show. He's yeah. great. Yep. So I, I frankly think they're making the right moves. You can't the, make the entire company move on a dime. That's impossible. Yep. Uh, they've got their money in a lot of great places. They've got a good tech platform over at over at Hearst, and I think that struggles are if you had, you know, Albert Einstein, you know, two twenty thousand Albert Einsteins. There's going to be pain going from being the most dominant print company to, to pivot to digital. There's no way for them to not suffer pain and changes. They can't see the exact future. It's really easy for me to sit in this table starting from zero. Yeah. We're going to make all the right moves, and you know we've got no link to the past, and we had no emotional attachment to making decisions at SI. In fact, I wanted to do it quickly before we got emotional, right? Um, so we've got that luxury. So I think those two companies, done. I think there's been other print companies, won't mention their name, who've probably had bigger challenges. Their technology is not strong. Um, I think that their DNA, you know, just never broke from print. Uh, and that everybody wants to. It's not that people don't know that the future is yeah. here. Yeah. But the problem with a big public company is you have to hit quarterly numbers. So do you have the cojones to say, we're going to cut out, you know, $300 million of revenue because we think that this other thing that we're going to do is going to replace that. Really hard to do as a head of a public company. And then you get stuff like, well, he moved too hard, too fast, and maybe well, he was not the right guy. There <laughs> it's too, like, and, yeah. You know, and, and, and they got massive morale issues. As, it, 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 any of these companies, because you've got layoffs, because you have declining revenue, uh, very, very intractable situation. Um, yeah, they're smart people, but boy, it's a real yeah, hundred percent. Really in fact, Troy's a tech right? guy. I mean, he's really. I mean, that's how he's coming at it. Mm -hmm. um, what about um, some of the sort of the taste maids, the pop sugars, the bustles? They've struggled as well. That's digitally native uh, media with multiple brands. Again, would you would would the would the diagnosis there be again? This is all top down. This is you're trying to both do technology and media with those guys. If you had to kind of assess, yeah, I mean, I, listen, those they're, competitors, they're, they're, you know, all, all of all of the people that you mentioned and BuzzFeed have done have been extra, extraordinary pioneers, and uh, you know, I would say it's hard to judge people um, who have turned the needle. And, and if things have gotten challenging because the world has changed and they weren't able to pivot, um, it's like criticizing somebody for inventing the, you know, 
ME-262 jet aircraft. It's not a Raptor now, and but they did invent the, you know, first operational military jet, <laughs> right? And, you know, Pop Sugar really did some cool stuff, yeah. right? And I'm not saying that it's still not a great brand. BuzzFeed came out early and figured out what was going on um, before uh, the free content game was shut off, right? I mean, eventually, if you're relying on somebody else home, for... Yeah, yeah, yeah right? Idea. If you're relying on a third-party monopoly for all your traffic, um, I think it's a big challenge. And, um, uh, you know, I think, you know, clickbait, link bait, um, heavy ad load, listicles, all these things were tricks that don't... I'm not saying that any of the companies I just mentioned did any of these things. But usually when, when I look at a really clever engineer who's got a new idea and say, look what I've been able to do... You know, I do this and turn this dial and I'm able to arbitrage, blah, blah, blah. They all are temporary tricks. And I'd say the one thing that's different about Maven and the reason why I think um, somebody might say, well, gee, you get a lot of traffic from Google. It's, it's, it's not a trick, right? It, they're not clickbait headlines using other people's content and a robot, right? Yep. Uh, we work with great journalists, Ten years ago, Google was not that sophisticated in terms of content. Today, they scan the page and make sure that you didn't copy the content elsewhere, that it's not basically aggregation and arbitrage, right? So Google rewards authenticity and professionalism and quality journalism. Um, they actually evaluate what the domain name is to see if it's actually a real journalist company, you know, not a bot from, you know, Russia, right? And so I think there's a lot of people out there that were doing clever tricks to make money. They had people in rooms coming up with headlines and testing headlines, doing the same content eight times. Like all those things, I Farming, think... Farming, basically. Yeah, yeah, right? We don't do that, yeah. right? And, you know, what, what we do is, you know, we do the obvious headline, right? The player name, the team name, and have great content. So, <laughs> what's wrong with that? That sounds good. Um, speaking of sounding good, um, let me end on this note. One of the perks, obviously, of uh, of of uh, now being involved in SI and operating uh, operating SI is things like the Super Bowl. Um, what do you guys have planned for the Super Bowl at SI? And who do you like between the Chiefs and the 49ers? And, and that's probably a loaded question, given you're a West Coast guy. Uh. <laughs> well, my kids don't like the 49ers because they become a um, Seahawks fan. They, be they become a Seahawk <laughs> rival. I'm going to be traveling with somebody, some people who are big 49ers fans. Okay. And I, I really think that the Super Bowl uh, comes down to um, the quarterback eight times out of ten. And Mahomes is just unstoppable. That's you how can't I feel about it. Yeah, well, you, can't, yeah. you can't do a game plan against him. <laughs> and you know, uh, got a great defense. So that, I lost two weeks in a row. I bet the underdog two weeks in a row. Oh, you did? I killed. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, I mean, I would probably bet on Mahomes. Yeah. Not, you know, if, if you had to put your money. I don't know what the somewhere. line is. Uh, not that this is a, a batting show. But, yeah, I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to check that out after. But the Super Bowl is, you know, the biggest corporate event in the world. And the timing. It matters. It matters. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and the timing couldn't be better for us. You know, our great partners at ABG are partnering to to do an amazing Super Bowl party. Black Eyed Peas are playing and and a bunch of young, great artists that I've never heard of are going to be there, but everybody else has heard of, but right. I'm, yeah. I'm not good at music. Yeah. Sucks when that happens. Right. But yeah, <laughs> but, um, yeah I mean, uh, everyone uh, in the ad industry is aware of Maven. That's just, that's just a fact. We're coming in, uh, uh, we're very big and premium and great technology and coming out of nowhere and uh, so the Super Bowl is here, and uh, we're going to be doing business down there, right? And it's, uh, it's a great hospitality opportunity, but one that um, is aligned perfect with Sports Illustrated. On the cover, we have every Miami Super Bowl MVP on the cover that's still alive, and you know, from Joe Namath to John Elway. Uh, there are going to be great players down there that we're going to provide access for, you know, clients. Uh, and, you know, we do believe that if with if all the advertisers in one place, we think that investing in, in building those relationships um, so they understand uh, what we're about, uh, that's, that's a, it, it's a good expenditure of shareholder money. It accelerates growth of revenue. 
I think some short-sighted people will say, well, gee, why are you uh, spending money on, you know, on hospitality? Um, uh, it's not about taking care of people who are decision makers because everybody's doing that. But if you've got a product that's going to help them be more successful, then um, you definitely need to take advantage of the times when they're all in one place, right? And if you don't make it a place where people want to hang out, you're not going to have that conversation. And so, um, you know, going back to MySpace, to Yahoo, to everything we've d- we're doing, um, we believe in ad agencies. We think there's a place for them. We think they're totally focused on brand building taking all things into consideration and if you give them a budget they're going to think about efficiencies and they want to keep their job i mean it's a uh uh, it's a i think it's a great part of the ecosystem and so they're very tough because their clients are tough on them right and so we want to show up and say hey look great value great efficiency safety brand uplift the disciplines that we have on our business is good for the agency business and the agency business wants to do a great job for their clients and um so yeah we're gonna we're gonna be down there working and uh uh, and and like i said the timing couldn't be better for the launch of 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 our company that sounds great that's 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 really fun that's really exciting and james thanks for coming in and sharing the story with us awesome thank you bye-bye that's a wrap on this episode of the medium rules with alan baldishan For more information, go to our website at www.hballp.podcasts.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And don't forget to rate us on Apple Podcasts.